been a while since I brought in a countdown idea that outright baffled viewers at a mere wince of the title. Well, baffle it up. With the earliest shards of this art form tracing back to more than four decades ago, and concerning how much of a business it's always been, there are a lot of minds out there to seize opportunities. Like the film industry, the video game industry exploded in its prominence, and were showcased in many different ways as the years went on. Genres, to put it dimly. Any way you categorize it, there are a huge sum of genres to be seen within this medium, and I figured it's about damn time I poured out scope on the matter. Not only am I talking about my favorite genres, I'm also bringing to light my top choice for every single one of them. Genre elitist, as I say. Bit of a mix between top 10 favorite genres and number one contenders for every one of them. There is but one warning I have for all of you. The opinions I hold for each one of these types of games and its top representative probably will be conflicting with what the general majority of you think. Whoo, <laughs> getting excited. Okay then, onward. <laughs> For all the guidelines video games usually cram in your face, it's not always a standard for you to have to listen to them. You wanna go past that area? Ha! But my money went into you. You're mine. Fuck you! I do what I want! I like that motto. While not a technical name for a genre, sandbox games are exactly what they sound. You're a kid? thrown into a sandbox. And hey, lucky for you, it's got a bunch of neat stuff in it. There are objectives to do, but they're almost completely optional. And you have the 100% choice to do whatever you want. These are a do-it-yourself slap to the face. That's the kind of slap I like. Grand Theft Auto is the undeniable champ, and while I love the series, there's another sandbox type of game that I love more than any Rockstar product. And it's about damn time I talked about it again. Sci-fi buffs and conservative politicians rejoice. The title of your dreams exists after all. Good God, would you look at that? Ain't that just plummy? I think they're trying to tell us something. Oh no, boss! He found us out! Girl, shut up! A name you couldn't possibly not laugh at. Destroy all humans had a thought. Hey, these humans have fun with the drug pillaging. How's about we kill them for it? So, I guess one day, aliens just subducted Grand Theft Auto? About time! They could have gone after the cattle, the oil. Hell, they could have taken Bob Barker. But no, they got into our games. Good job, aliens. They did a good thing here. I mean, the concept of controlling an alien to do whatever the hell you want in a big human city seems like a no-brainer. Makes me wonder why nobody else got this idea sooner. For any time aliens are shown in games, they're almost always, you know, around space. Either that or they talk some kind of semi-shit babble talk with words like Destroy all humans tip the common traits of alien stuffness with its own glowing middle finger down a pit of death. Because, well, listen to Crypto. Neat trick. And then... I kick a little monkey ass. Have I been sucked into the fly of disbelief? We got an alien that talks in deadpan, wisecracks, and is like a human. This is already interesting. What else you got? For fury's sake, look at this! Death rays, mind control, telekinesis, some gun that makes cars go ape shit. Fucking meteor gun. My wallet just shat itself. This is what happens when you put Roger from American Dad in charge of GTA 4.5's development. You get a comedic, campy, delightfully destructive, interactive take on a cheesy B-movie with aliens. It's like an answered prayer! There is a god! It rightfully feels reminiscent of Grand Theft Auto's work, as it clearly shows inspiration, but not in the My hucka ran away! Crash plane! Get another bitch! Sex! Kind of way. But more like, you know, I'm a weapon-wielding furon with nothing to do. What is my limit? Yeah. Nothing. You are motherfucking crypto! Entire buildings are disposable to you. Cars are your frisbees! Yeah, there's a plot with objectives. But the reason you're playing is to be crypto. And of course his personality makes him speak in a very savvy nature. In fact, it feels eerily similar to Invader Zim. What? What? Are you telling me? No. No, you're lying. Crypto! The mothership has somehow been destroyed! Ooh! They did it! You Clever people. For something as serious as alien attacks, it's refreshing in so many ways that it's taken in the opposite way. Nobody in the game is of a serious nature. Crypto's not. Rob Paulson's not. You're sure as hell not. So, let's kill stuff! <laughs> 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 Nothing can stop me! What the fuck? Is that Godzilla? What the hell's he doing here? Isn't he supposed to be in theaters? Oh, whatever. He's dead. He's all dead. This act of being on lizard violence is brought to you by Destroy All Humans 2. Make jokes, not sense. Oh, horror games. What can one say about you? Uh, 
You're very good. Uh, no, I can't say that. You make us piss our pants, and we love that. Okay, this is getting sad. My consensus is more along the line of, oh, how I really don't care about you. You always find a way to make me groan with the pittiest of pity. You try to scare me, but all I do is snore. Eh, alright, listen. It's not the best idea to start things off talking like that, but I can't say this is one I think of too highly. The idea of horror-based stimulation is one of the most subjective topics you can ever look at. But apparently, if you're scared of anything and the game's not rated them, you're the biggest wuss ever. Yeah, isn't the world great? Unsettling and well-implemented elements made in more friendly games that took a moment to scare you apparently wasn't good enough. Or even worth saying, hey, thanks for using your brain. So they had to make a whole damn division just to discredit those who used it cleverly. Does that mean I hate the genre? No, I just feel in some areas it's really not worth the investment of anyone's time. They take your money and say to you, boo. And that's usually it. I can't get into them. They just don't amuse me. Unless given some eerie designs, maybe some extra thought placed in areas other than I can scare you! Yeah, I get that there's supposed to be some kind of narrative, but that's not what they're trying to shove in your bored as plywood face. Oh, sorry, volume was turned down. Guess you have to try again. Some mix it up, but I myself don't buy games to get a scare. Misconstrue my words all you want, I've played plenty of them. But the genre isn't trash. There are two games of this type that I actually really like. These two games are Resident Evil 4 and Dead Space 2, but I prefer Dead Space 2, so slap a number on that. Have you ever wanted to be alone, lost, freezing in space with no one to tell you it's gonna be okay? No? Well, you picked up the wrong game, sir. FIFA's down aisle 666. Space. It's really fucking big. But even it can't contain how many games that's been made about it. Out of the buttload of space games, Dead Space and its sequels are standouts. The sequel may have lacked the same wow feeling of the original, but that's not really an issue with me. It took the idea and setting of the first and gave us something even bigger. There is more exposition on the whole fiasco, but the concept stays true. You live, whether it means fighting the creatures straight out of Satan's disgusting navel, or God help you staying away from that fucking eye-poking machine. God damn it, no! I hate you, eye-poke machine! Eww. Uh, yeah, need I mention how effective the chills are here? Not just that little moment, but Dead Space 2 does something unlike a lot of horror games. It actually kind of thrills me. Something about these creature designs and where they're all set, it's really effective. True, it leans more on the contemporary side, using things like loud noises and jump scares. But being alone in such a big space station, imagine the space colony arc with little color and filled with undead alien corpses, with pincers for arms. They freak the hell out of me. They take every moment possible to try and make you fear these things, and it works. Do I even need to speak for the baby necromorph scene? Wear condoms, kids! Yeah, all over the new window. The game makes sure to use its atmosphere, creature design, and approachable gameplay with a likable protagonist to pull out the best within EA's fancy trick hat. Going back to the horror elements, Dead Space as a whole manages to take horror flick cliches I find tiresome and actually make something out of it. It totals up to being what I call Metroid's mentally disturbed stepbrother whose number you blacklisted. It's all around not as fun or approachable as Metroid, but it has just the right amount of immersion and grasp on what the main threat is. How Isaac interacts with everything highlights all the scary elements they try to show us while still giving us the thrill of the gameplay. I have fun action to keep me going, and real freaky shit popping out of me in every corner. That's how you do it. It's both horror and a game. Don't see that too often. Silent Hill, huh? I think I'd rather get a nap in. Yeah. That'll do. Surprise exam. What's the best method of handling a problem? Ask the bad people to stop fighting. Oh, giving me cavities. How about getting your ass in there and scrunch up some faces? Oh, love the new face. Fighting games. The virtual way of living out impossible badassery. While there's not a whole lot to them, fighting games are some of the most surprisingly fun pieces of action found in a console. They were the one thing you could never not see in a proper arcade. They're classics. As a result, a breed of insects that never go away. But somehow I like. Talking about them feels weird, as they're all very similar in concept and as straightforward as spamming two buttons. There's a lot to pick from. And you know-it-alls think you can read me like a retardedly expensive textbook. Oh, Smash Brothers. Called it. You called the dead numbers slappy. True, I like Smash. But hey, Mortal Kombat's nice too. And what the hell, I like the number 9. M, K, and 9. Does anyone know a game like that? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, here's one we can't go without. FATALITY! Control. Back way before when the precious quarter machines were choking to death infinitely day in and day out, it was difficult not to hear the much maligned MK label. 
It was everywhere. At the laundromat, pizza places, and Jackie's goddamn nightmares. The original MK Trilogy was some pretty solid stuff, but with the jump to now, it's appropriately at its best. Although, they effed up the title. It's Mortal Kombat. They had this in the early 90s? What the fuck was I playing? Anywho, while you all squabble over Scorpion or Sub-Zero being the better fighter, I'll type something up, because I got a lot to say about this one. It's good. Nah, I'm just messing. Can't you take a joke? FATALITY! Stop it! As far as the oh-so-controversial modern series reboot goes, this might just be the best I've seen. What makes MK good? Violence. Blood. Gore. BLOOD! Man, this game's nuts! The best thing I feel this one did was what everyone wants a reboot to actually do. Take the original blueprints, keep it intact, but go all the way with it. And despite the 3D models, they didn't take a huge dump and try too hard to make it 3D and cutting edge. Classic fighters should never be like that. <laughs> New entries of the series focused on the main staples like the roster and gameplay. This one has it all! Shit ton of characters, all so great. Fatality so brutal, some regions weren't even allowed to get it for three years. Just look at this. Nah, this is too good to block. Bloody combat with smooth controls. It's so much fun to just rip apart your enemy. <laughs> Mangle those motherfuckers! This is one game that really brings out my twisted side. <laughs> what was really weird was how it handled the single player. For once, the world of MK has an interesting narrative. One that really does feel MK-ish. And this acronym's getting old, huh? Alright, I'll change it, okay? <laughs> Mark it is. Mark number 9 knows how to handle his story. It's simple, but it actually keeps you playing. Just cutscenes and action. I'm so proud of you, Mark. You listened to what we said and fixed your shit. Now you're a big shot again. You're all grown up. Boy, that sounds so hokey. Fatality. No! The gore appeals to me more than it should, but everything else it did right with the comeback rightfully justifies this as my favorite traditional fighting game. Arcades may be dead, but the nostalgic thrills can still be felt. You keep it to your Hadoukens, I'm sticking with a good old F-bomb. Speaking of genres I rarely touch upon, let's talk about first-person shooters. You know, it's best I come clean rather than lie with this forked ton of mine. I'm not running some kind of propaganda here, but for whatever reason, they're generally not my kind of game. The idea of shooting things within whatever the hell you play games on is something that's been milk drier than a mooing pokey. Wouldn't really call them uncreative, but shit! They're everywhere! And it's a concept not interesting enough for me to play more than once a year. That's how it's always been with me, especially back in high school. Hey, you wanna play a rousing seven hours of brown the video game? My answer would always remain the same. Dude, please, I just washed my hands. But this doesn't mean I don't enjoy games within this genre. Honorable mentions would go to Halo 1, GoldenEye, Turok, Bioshock, and Half-Life 2, but goddamn, Team Fortress 2 rules my life! Well, isn't that a big shocker? Valve, man! Bunch of awesome bastards, aren't they? I guess that's what too many hats on your head does to you. For those unlucky enough to have never even played it, or any skeptics watching, a question ceases to be answered. What's the big frickin' deal about Team Fortress 2? It's nothing but a hat simulator. Okay, to be serious for a moment, I am tired of people calling it that. Fuck that! In spite of the central focus, the shooting, remaining true to the genre, Team Fortress 2 is special. Valve put legitimate heart and elbow grease into their 10th masterpiece, and it shows in a way that can't be ignored. There's a lot of genuine style to be seen here, for an FPS and just as a product in general. The gameplay of most FPS games rarely ever catch my eye, but this, I take notice immediately. As the title suggests, the focus of it all is centered around teamwork, an ensemble cast of wonky guns for hire take it upon themselves to fight for conquest. But this isn't a one-class do-it-all type of system. No. Bouncing off each other's strengths and covering weaknesses is the name of the game. That's certainly unheard of with this kind of game. Any other FPS would have had you set with just one soldier. That's it. You can get any job done just fine by yourself. If you try that here, you'll most likely be reduced to gory giblets. Fucking soldier. The whole game encourages camaraderie, and it works very well. There are a few exceptions to this, but it's incredible just how balanced the classes are. What they do well, they do exceptionally well but they're not completely unstoppable. And also, they were really king on making these characters hard to forget. All of them harbor something all their own, and it really does feel like nine different oddballs in a group. Color. That's the perfect word to define this game. Now this is what being a good developer is all about. You know, actually giving a shit, and produce something they've dreamt up. Not just cough up something everyone else is doing. With something this good, I don't care if they make the third step or not. It's a never-ending expansion pack. And it's free! I love this game.
This won't be the last time, Team Fortress. The insanity may not ever end. Have I been keeping your attention just fine? And there they go. They always run! <laughs> yes, it's not every waking moment you see someone sit down and WANT to play a puzzle game. <laughs> lordy lordy. This is easily the biggest sleeper. Not going by the common definition here. I literally mean YAWN. Despite the numbers it sells, not much buzz is centered around it. The success is easily traced back to Tetris, yeah, but there's not many other big names of this kind. And it just seems to me that more and more consumers are forgetting about this one. And it makes you wonder why. Are people just getting stupider? That's one theory, but I think it may come from the stick of it. Puzzle games in general are very much the same. Clusters of stackable units, normally blocks, are toppled together and you gotta get rid of them with the mix and matching bullshit. That sums up quite a bit of them, surprisingly. And while they're fun, there's really not all that much to most of them. And it's especially baffling since riddles in themselves are a timeless art. But for me to really feel the sensation of you know, puzzle solving, it's gotta have style, creativity, a second thought given to the big picture. Oh hi Valve! Shit, son. The icing on that godforsaken cake we never ever got to taste. Portal, the series. What's the verdict? I love it, I love it, I love it. It seems whatever genre these physics happy wizards set out to tackle, that one something produced excels past the entire concept set on paper. I download their games with expectations lower than a depressed stun fist. Then I play it, and all of a sudden, I start giving a shit. What is this black magic? Valve has already made me love a member of the FPS genre so much. Can they do the same thing, but with puzzles? I recall the original being really good, but I have its sequel not only fresh in my mind from a recent playthrough, but its very own rank on my list of favorites. We need more games like this. Really, we do. By popular definition and not by any actual meaning of the term, a sequel means that it's inferior to the original. I mean, for real? Can you really say that anymore? Portal 2 throws that notion in the incinerator for good. And it figures, why not throw a goddamn party with this, hmm? I'll supply the cake. Not only is it better than the original, it almost makes you forget about the first game. A follow-up to Portal seemed like a dead-end route. Nobody expected them to think of one to begin with, but turning into a full-time narrative? No, no. There's no way they could have done that. The whole premise behind Portal 2 is a similar deal to the first, except you find yourself waking up to one of the best highlights of the game. Wheatley, or as I like to call him, Rabbit Luigi with a pitch shift. It is nice to have a sense of lone helplessness with a concept like this, but having a British quirk tag along with you is also nice. Uh, you just, you just jumped. But never mind, say Apple. Apple. <laughs> I never get tired of that. There's definitely a lot more depth added to the game this time around. Lots of old history is brought to the surface, and it's amazing how well they utilize the setting itself. You're still met with the test laid out for human lab rats, but there are moments where you're left wandering the depths by yourself. The unique puzzle solving elements that made the first game such a hit are back and are delivered with more than full force. With the introduction of gels, tractor beams, laser redirection, and more clever uses of momentum, the game, more so than ever, really makes you think. I'm gonna be honest, I do think Portal has an educative quality. Nothing like Shakespeare had an exquisite taste in undies. It encourages thorough analyzing skills. How to map out everything around you and solve the conflict. With motivation. Like say, getting the fuck away from this psycho bitch potato. There are literally times where the last method of advancing you could possibly think of is the surefire way of moving forward. The puzzles here are above notch. It really does feel like you're at the mercy of scientific testing. And might I say, I often forget I'm even controlling trolling somebody. She's a silent protagonist, sure, but Portal supplies a potent and clear realm of existence. It's so immersive, I completely forget about the character I'm controlling. What does that tell you? Take it from me right now. Download this beauty. Portal 2 has a lot of characteristics I admire in a game. Clever writing, inventive gameplay, thrilling sense of atmosphere, thought, and just an all-around entertaining presence. It knows exactly what it's supposed to be. A sequel to one of the most original games ever conceived. And therein lies the great secret of Portal 2. It does nothing but expand. The narrative's expanded, the characters are expanded, the gameplay's expanded, the lore is expanded. It's all here, folks. Seriously, one of the best PC games, period. 3D Platformers. 
Oh god, if the idea of gaming innovation ever had a visit set in stone, you couldn't even find a more appropriate dartboard to frag. Out of every one of the variants spawned from the industry, this is one breed that very few others can be seen touching. The advent of 3D brilliantly enhanced the art form as we knew it. Even today, this prospect's wow factor is still dazzling. But for every bold modernization, there has to be those daring first takers. The pioneers that would pull the very idea out of minds and out to the world. 3D platformers, head for head, were the ones responsible. Yeah, it's debatable, but the verdict remains firm in the ground. 3D platformers are legendary. Not only do we owe a lot to these kind of games, but the general quality they emanate is, to me at least, some of the all-time best. Super Mario, Spyro, Ratchet and Clank, Rayman, Crash Bandicoot, Benja Kazooie. Hell, you can argue that Sonic belongs in this category. Some of the all-time greats are of this type. But, you know, my favorite isn't any of those. Hot Damn is not even based on a video game franchise, but rather a forgotten friendly icon. Some of you may already know, but hey, it's been a while since I've spoken breath of it, so let's let the flag swerve wildly. Are you ready, kids? And teens. Adults. Aliens, maybe. I don't judge. I broke the tempo. SHIT! <laughs> Hello once again, friend. It's odd. For as many great names the 3D platform behemoth drags with it everywhere, the one I stick closest to was not only a one-hit marvel, but it was spawned from a damn cartoon. The former champ of all Nicktoons, Robert Squarepants. <laughs> haven't called him that yet. A popular IP all his life, SpongeBob has made his own debut on our territory for quite some time. If you've seen the top 5 I dedicated to him a while back, you would know that I love his games. They're some of the brightest examples of how powerful proper care for a licensed product can really be. I say this because it's honestly a bit inspiring to think just how Battle for Bikini Bottom itself is categorized. It's a licensed game, and is described as following a shiny, important object collect -a on formula. That recipe spells out nothing but questionable, uh, miscarriages for a game adaptation. Oh god, were those worries maimed, disemboweled, and thrown to the laughing, joking numbnuts. For those of you hell-bent on hating the new Spongebob episodes, you'll be happy to know that this game sticks very close to the source material's past greatness. Spongebob was a kick-ass show back in the day, but this? <laughs> Central premise and all, Battle for Bikini Bottom shares an exact nature to that of a classic Spongebob episode. The plot is simple and easy to follow, there's color everywhere, and even though it's a different team than those who made the original show, the boys back at THQ kept true to the same witty writing. It's like a classic SpongeBob episode made into a 3D platformer. That sentence right there should have been the tagline, and it alone would have made me buy the game. But it's the gameplay itself that makes Battle for Bikini Bottom such a hit for me. Yeah, the witty writing by itself can make any fan of SpongeBob giddy with so much muchness, but this is a game after all. Its entire structure is presented in a way that any fan of 3D platformers, new or old, can understand and enjoy. The shiny do whatcha mafuckers are present and the goal is collect them all. And isn't that what we love in games? Better collect all them steering wheels because god for sweet pumpkin seed pop tarts. Fish can drive, but can't be mechanics. Shakespeare. Now that I think about it, there's little newfangled ideas here. The plot's been done to death with little to no new twists, and the overall basis is a taste more familiar than our own maw. It's been called a Banjo-Kazooie ripoff, but why is that an issue? Yes, you collect shit sometimes. But that's like saying the way characters pant heavily in action movies is unoriginal because breathing's been done before. Tiresome concepts, in fact I dare even say it's cliche in a lot of areas, but there's a reason why it gets by. It's goddamn Spongebob. Every second, there's a bright moment, a funny line. Characters we enjoyed on the show are treated just as well here. In fact, some of them are better. Barnacle Boy almost killed me in this game. It just has that whimsical Spongebob verb all over. The gameplay may not be innovative, but it works well enough to emulate legitimate fun. Fun, that's the defining word. The game itself is huge. To this day, I have yet to 100% it. That last suck. But as I said, the strongest point of this game is the source material itself, and how they play off it. Never does it feel like I'm playing something outside the license. The brand on its own keeps these reused trends we've seen so damn much fresh and interesting. It's all implemented so well that it blends. It's the kind of game that you can't truly put the love down on paper, but rather one that plays for itself. From my own ideals, the most perfect a 3D platformer has ever got. And by this point in time, remains my all-time favorite of the genre. Victory Screech for all THQ.
For as much fun treading a 3D world by your own two feet feels, sometimes it's just more entertaining to go at it with higher velocity. Something along the lines of grab wheel, shift gear, slam pedal, and WOOHOO! That's just what the racing genre is. Like platformers, racing style video games have remained a stable part of the industry for an awful long time. The earliest known example of the stimulation chilled alongside Pawn in the Odyssey when even they were still young. Debatable or otherwise, this might just be the first fully established genre in video game history. Racing simulators have seen all kinds of amazing success. Either solo, with friends, distant, or at your own side, this is a sport beyond sports. I may not let the word fly about the genre itself on the channel, but whenever I do, it's pointed squarely on one prime specimen. Racing. Ah, the favorites. Back in their prime time, it seems that whatever genre Rare Rare got their brilliant British hands on turned to something prim, shiny, and worth more than any overpriced spy revolver. They were like a precursor to what Valve would become in the new millennium. Whatever Nintendo could do back in those days, Rare had the ability to do it even better. Their trump card for the legendary Mario Kart 64 was so well done, I could barely see competition. Diddy Kong Racing, from how I like to see it, focuses on a lot more than just the core racing mechanics. Right from even the initial logo sequence, you can feel a sense of style coming from it. All the characters are so brightly designed and so fun to look at that they probably could have starred in a freaking late 90s cartoon show. A chicken with overalls, named Drumstick is about as rated G as you can get. Already seeing this lineup of kid sightly characters is enough to turn ahead, maybe a little too far. But the thing that caught most players off the guard was that rather out of place word, adventure. Um, sorry, left my tunic at home guys. Can't play this one. Oh, I get ya. You sneaky bastards! You could've called this anything! It could've been the shit you came for, insert coin! But nah, it's an adventure! This was obviously an attempt to make the cart mechanics more like a full-on single-player romp, and I personally think it works. On the surface, yeah, it's just an overworld. It's not really all that grand, and the scary pig head freaks the shit out of me. But giving the players some means of environmental trekking is something that oddly stimulates an adventurous mind. I really mean it. It does feel like more of a campaign experience. They knew things had to be simple in terms of plot, and Timber Island ties it in all together so well, it makes the single player infinitely stronger than the multiplayer, which is universally unheard of with any other racer. With this different approach, I feel Diddy Kong Racing serves itself better as a standalone experience than every other racing game out there. The core single player experience is much better, and that alone draws me to it. They also took notice of the idea of vehicles. Mario Kart, and pretty much every big selling racer beforehand, stuck with only one means of transportation. Thus, the plane and hovercraft were tossed in there. This allowed the races to unfold on all terrains. Land, water, air, and even space. The thematics of all the level domains may be commonplace, but the amount of variety the three different vehicle gives makes you forget all about that. The tracks are all well designed, like Mario Kart, but I think the sheer diverse nature of the kart play enhances any of the already kick-ass levels. Star City, you expect the novel? Oddly, the one thing I take most merrily from Diddy Kong Racing is actually the soundtrack. The phrase, music makes a game, exists in this one. And for the sweet, 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 sweet love of dead khaki lucky, them beats! God! The advent of 3D in games was a phenomenal shift of perspective. Many of the least impressive experiences made before the jump were now being heralded as the absolute best. Kinda funny how things change, huh? Both racing simulators and platformers went through one hell of a reimagining. And when you think 3D in games, these are the two most think of first. I mean, Mario 64. It's hard not to think that given the mention. But as big as their makeovers were, there was one breed that came out far more fabulous because of the shift. The Big Adventure. Games structured with 2D set in mind were surprisingly limited. Back then, a lot of us were completely fine with the way of things. No matter how much some may bitch, now with the massive expansion set towards visual and technical depth, the privilege of embarking on a virtual adventure is something to cherish even greater. My sense of awe just seems to adore this genre. The grandest pioneer of this type, the Zelda series, is one to be respected. It's a name that may as well be a commonplace synonym for grandiose. But for as incredible as they may be, they just can't beat Metroid Prime. 
Oh, oh, this one! Some may question this pick for a good few reasons. Better adventure game than Zelda, you say? Dislike, unsubscribe, tweet some nasty shit. You're dead to me! Just kidding. The other might inquire about Metroid Prime's exact genre. Many with a misinformed mind may categorize it as a 3D platformer. I've even heard some call it a first-person shooter. Quite an odd consensus, seeing how it's been officially confirmed as a first-person adventure game by the big end themselves. Sheesh. I'm no Nobel Prize nuthead, but I tweak my monocle and say, this here is reinvention, man. Prime 1 is an ideal case of the 3D jump phenomena franchises were endured in the late 90s. There are few 2D games more cherished than Super Metroid, so Metroid was just another one of those names that was hard to picture in any kind of 3D. And with a new team tackling such an iconic license, it's easy to understand why one would have been worried. Well, even rivaling Mario, the Grand Leap Metroid made between dimensions is one of the best in gaming history. It's a seamless transition made by Retro, but with everything now flying the three-dimensional colors, it's all emphasized much better than before. The world of Talon 4 is very similar, yet so different from Planet Zebus. It's darker, it's larger, yet it's still a setting you feel trapped and lonely in. I think Metroid's <clears throat> prime strength comes from the very reason why I ranked it as an elitist of the genre. It's an adventure, and the way it's handled can't be any more effective. Not a single hand to hold you. Not even one word of dialogue is given. It's you versus the alien world nobody seems to pronounce right. Because of the limited interaction between something like key NPCs or some means of blunt exposition, Metroid's method of speaking the narrative, especially in Prime 1, promotes immersion. It really does feel like I'm in it for myself alone. There's no partner to help, no magical force leading me to a higher power. It's just a freelance hunter doing her thing. All of this works, and it's really, really smart stuff. It's one of the best examples of what video game questing is made of, something that probably makes Zelda quite jealous. The plot is rather rudimentary. Prime One's plot is essentially a hunt around for an alien menace. It's nothing profound, but sometimes that's really the best way to go. Some say they get lost and they hate it. You know what? Cool. And hell, even I get lost on occasion. But the environments they have you go through are just too memorable and too well designed for me to quit. The gameplay thing still works too. They give you the weapons, and it's up to you. It respects your skills just right. With the expansion of multiple toggling beams, and especially visors, the abilities Samus has always had are expanded to a nice degree. Sure, there are some things I don't like about it, such as the bullshit ability loss at the beginning, and the artifact hunt can be a pain if not prepared for, but I still believe this is technically speaking, the very best Metroid game, the king of adventures, and a blast throughout. You may think I'm fanboying, and <laughs> yeah, I kinda am. All I know for sure is, bravo, Retro. Speaking of Retro, the 2D platformer. Yeah, I actually find this to be in its own separate category from its 3D offspring. It smells a bit like bullshit, but you'll soon see what I mean. 2D platform games saved us all, from a fate worse than any kind of death gaming later gave us. It wasn't just game over, it was all over for our kind. In this time of darkness, a light shunned, in the form of this very type. But it wasn't just Super Mario that set us free. The countless others he rapidly inspired and fought together with shaped the third generation of consoles. It was literally a reawakening from the trust we lost in the games we once played. They're not just mere iconic remnants of the past, they're still with it. 2D platformers are like our brain, can't push forward without it, and while a lot aren't all that thankful for having them, you can never truly get rid of the damn thing. 2D platformers are the most important genre we have. It has just as many big names in it as the 3D titles, and despite not covering as many dimensions, they're still great games. Almost all people see red when they hear the mention, well me, I'm blue, and all I see is blue. We've stepped past the first 80% of the spectrum, games I really enjoy, several of which chill around in my top 30, some even top 10, but nothing. Nothing is quite like the final two. Games that are so preposterously close to my heart, not even experimental microsurgery can pry them away from me. The never even touched master of the duty platformers, Mega Man X4. For all the neglect this series has attained from Cashcom, all the cancelled projects that could have been something special, you can wad all that up into an agitated fist of steel, size it up for Kronos, put a giant 
fuck you on it, and it still won't truly bother me. Because playing this game can soldier me through anything. It's an immortal symbol of several equally important things. One of them being, Capcom has flooring talent. I don't care how questionable their practices have been in recent years. Any company that can make something like this is a special kind of special. Mega Man X4 is a pioneer. Not necessarily of the entire genre, but certainly for the license. It's a much bigger jump than most others credit it for. It's not just a surprise sequel. This was the first point in the series where things grew more edgy, and in a very good way. The game is centered around the whole Rebel Force tension, having you trashed all sectors they've occupied, but never do I feel like the story is completely halted. It's a setup that works very well, and wow, anime cutscenes. I can't believe nobody appreciates this. It's about time the storytelling became more focused, because Mega Man's lore is the richest I've ever seen. I prefer gameplay over story any day, but isn't it incredible when they can actually get both down? The gameplay from X's side of things has gone relatively unchanged, which is perfect the way it is. But the one thing everyone takes from this game is what it did to Zero. They didn't just make him more involved, they reinvented him. Through the then all new cinematics, we see just how much turmoil Zero goes through and how compelling of an icon he is. X gets his own side too, but this is really Zero's game. They flesh him out better in X4 than even the entire Zero series did. But best of all, they let us play as him. He doesn't have a buster, but he is the jealousy of every Jedi out there. Zero Saber combat is super smooth, faster than fast, and the most fun I've ever had while playing a side-scroller. It's like Sonic and Super Star Wars on RoboCrack! <laughs> the graphical style has taken such a nice leap forward, and I personally think it's the best the series has ever looked. It feels modern, but also classic. It's one of my favorites for pixel art, and it doesn't take any professor's name after trees to see why. Best ensemble of Mavericks, eargasmic soundtrack, kick-ass sprite work, flowing level design, alluring narrative, legendary characters, profound mythos, blood-pumping gameplay. This is a masterpiece. I don't care how much I'm prattling. He's my favorite platform of all time, and something I'll never grow apart from. Within a genre that stands and pummels the test of time, this is something we can't ever forget. Unless you're brand new to the channel, this is no surprise. I love this genre so much, I can't even sustain buildup. Kind viewers, passerbys and all, I present to you, the RPG. <laughs> Oh, the king has arrived! Bow. BOW, YOU FOOLS! If adventure games were ones you thought should be heavily praised, think again. This is Nerdvana. Experience points, flashy effects, ransacking NPC houses. It's the works. I'm really not sure why RPGs have such a wide appeal, but they really do. RPGs have probably the most dedicated base of fans I've ever seen. The Legion of FFers and Pokey Freaks should spell enough of that, but take a look at Kingdom Hearts, Earthbound, Fire Emblem, Elder Scrolls, Hales, Golden Sun, oh, holy shit people love their RPGs. I'll tell you why RPGs kick ass. They swear by their coding to bring us memorable plots, interesting enemy designs, and somehow they just assure that you will know their names. RPGs all around impress me the most, and plenty of what I consider the most flooring, downright best gaming experiences of all are a proud part of it. But which one is it? Is it Final Fantasy? Kingdom Hearts? Eh, not quite. Oh, it's Pokemon. It's gotta be Pokemon. Not even that. I present you with a heap of irony. And of all times I push the plumber aside in favor of my favorites, what do I go and do for number one? I give it to the plumber! <laughs> Or plumbers. Yeah, did you honestly think I'd leave them out? For all the years he's been with us, Mario has reinvented many parts of the industry. Platformers, racing, sports, the entirety of all 3D games. All of them renewed by his magic touch. I dare you to say that's not true. But from all the great work he spread to the genres of the world, the one I feel he's made the finest was the RPG, in the name of him and his bestest bro. Sweet Lord. Ounce for ounce, the Mario & Luigi series dominates my mind. Never have I seen such whimsy put into a video game before. After all the platforming, conquering Bowser and getting nothing from the ungrateful bitch, what does the Crimson Paladin go and do? Teams up with his bro, masters strategy, and takes on everything he hasn't. More so than any twist he's been experimented with, the Mario & Luigi series serves as both a brilliant rewrite and an expansion on all that the franchise has done. Oh, you mean like Seven Stars and Paper Mario did? 
even better. While previous takes on Mario RPGs geared towards the traditional works, Mario & Luigi heavily emphasizes on actual player input. Not only is each individual Mario brother controlled by a single signature button of their own, but you can also strike back in the form of on-command counterattacks and dodges. This is kick-ass. Unlike the traditional RPG hero whom says, OW! He hit me! Well now I'll hit back, Mario & Luigi both stay involved at the same time at all times. To this day, it's the only case I've seen where you can actually go throughout the entire turn-based adventure without taking a single point of unscripted damage. In an RPG for Christ's sake, this basically nukes any irksome RPG cliches that may piss me off. No random critical hits, no sudden misses, you are the vanguard of your own battle. It's constant rapid-paced action with elements of tactics still playing an apparent role. Not all enemies have a single definitive vulnerability. You can actually get royally screwed over for making the wrong move. It may defy the limitations, <coughs> I mean rules, of what garden variety RPGs tell the player, but for once in its entire existence, raw skill is the single dominant factor for a role-playing adventure. That alone makes it fly past all other similar type competitors, but it's everything else that pushes it to the highest limit. Everything that makes a game a true favorite of mine was given to all four of these masterpieces. Aside from the infectious gameplay, one of my favorite things about this mini franchise are all the crazy setups. If you found the whole storyline of the main series to be uninteresting, let's just see what Alpha Dream dreamt up for you. Some of the most off the wall, outlandish, and entertaining chronicles the bros have ever been written into. See, the genius behind Mario & Luigi's writing is its method of working in classic conflicts with fanciful composition and having the time of their lives with it, not to mention making comedy tours worth a humorous stick. The main Kickstarter of Peach needing to be rescued fools you into thinking it's gonna be just like every other Mario fairy tale, but soon pulls away the sense of familiarity and sticks in something completely unlike the Mario norm and steers everything else into an unformulaic frenzy. It's a plot outline that that while you may have an idea of what will happen, the games always keep you guessing. From Cackletta overtaking Bowser, literally, crushing alien mushrooms along your own infant selves, all the way to fighting Bowser in Bowser and Mount Pajamajaja itself, these games laugh at the face of convention. It prevents a familiar tone with unbelievable Mario storytelling. It's all weird and quirky, yet somehow able to take itself seriously when the plot demands it. It's the perfect blend of groundbreaking fun and dazzling creativity. While I do have a favorite, I can't find myself the nerve to put a single one on here. All of them have something unique and sickeningly fun to offer, and I don't see any of them having what I would call flaws. Superstar Saga, Partners in Time, Bowser's Inside Story, and Dream Team. They may all be continuations of one another, but there's nothing in or out of them that makes me think that other one's not worth playing. It's beyond common belief how far it's gone on, and still retaining strength from a second party developer no less. I've been called plenty of things, hipster, egomaniac, hack, but there is one thing you can call me, a Mario & Luigi fan. You may think they're just alright, maybe even not all that great, and that's fine. I, however, see them as something more. They've shown to me that a single good idea can challenge the very thing it's supposed to be. What started as a traditional RPG set on paper turned to the company's paramount gem. It has everything I love in a video game and pampers it. True, I could be full of shit, but I'm not lying. They're the greatest games I've ever seen. This has been Fawful's Minion, and it's good to be back.